I really do believe the Lord's going to do something this weekend. Uh, if, 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 anything, if this week is anything to go by, then certainly I think, I think he will. Um, we have a great God, I mean. And uh, take every opportunity uh, to receive ministry this weekend. Every opportunity. Because um, it's got to come from us. It's got to come out of us. We've got to want God. Um, so often before he breaks into our lives, into our hearts, into our experience. So uh, really consider it if, you, you know, if you've got uh, other plans than we understand. But if you possibly can, be here. There's a lot of people coming uh, that aren't from our church. So um, it's great for them to see a church that's really committed to it. So if you can make it, please do. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you for your goodness to us and your mercy that endures forever. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as we uh, take a few moments this evening to just delve into it and, and to try and understand uh, what you're saying to us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that uh, our hearts will be completely cleared and our minds completely cleared, that we will just listen to your voice. Lord, that we'll hear your Holy Spirit speak into our hearts and that you will just draw us closer to our Lord and our King, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, um, over the next few sessions, the next few studies, uh, I'm going to be looking at a character. Um, and I've been reading and rereading his story. And I found this character to be, to be uh, quite inspiring. Um, and everybody knows him. Um, but I don't think everybody understands him. And I think it would be good for us to try and understand this man because he is quite a character. Uh, and that is the, uh, the person called Samuel. And I, what I want to do is over the next few uh, studies is look a little bit at the life of Samuel. But look at it from a specific point. Um, and if I've got a title for these next couple of studies, it's going to be Samuel, a picture of obedience. Samuel, a picture of obedience. Um, and this man actually demonstrates one of the most crucial aspects of us as believers. And that is obedience. We're not, not going to develop much in our Christian life until we become obedient to the Father. It's a fundamental of our faith. It's a fundamental of our witness. And um, I just want to read a verse from uh, 1 Samuel 15. And this probably is the, you probably know the verse I'm going to read, but this is probably the, the key verse, the key verse concerning Samuel's life. And basically said everything about him. And we're going to look at a few of the pictures of his life. We're not going to be able to see everything because uh, we would be here for weeks and weeks and weeks. But um, this verse, verse 22. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. This verse really is the linchpin, if you like, of Samuel's ministry. It's the central point. It's the fulcrum upon which everything else rests. This understanding of obedience. And it goes right through his life from his very earliest days when he's with Eli in the, in, um, in the tabernacle and uh, right through to um, the choosing of 
David as the next king of Israel. Obedience. It's the key verse, I believe, in his life. And I've read his life, I've read it and reread it. And so I just want to look at this point over the next few studies. The life of Samuel, the key of his life. This was a life built on both the discipline and the biblical understanding of obedience. Okay? So it's built on a discipline, but also on this biblical understanding of obedience. And that's really what I want us to think about for a few minutes this evening, is what is obedience? What does the Bible say obedience is? What is biblical obedience? What does it look like in the life of a believer? And I just want us to think about it because I think this could be quite interesting and challenging for us all. Now, English Oxford Dictionary gives the definition of obedience. And it says that it is compliance with an order, a request, a law, or submission to another's authority. Let me just read that to you again. This is the English Oxford Dictionary's definition. Compliance with an order, with a request, with a law, or submission to one's, another person's authority. Now, when you think about this, this is um, a typical Western Greek based understanding of this word. It's what we understand to be obedience. Somebody tells you what to do and you do it. I think that if we're not careful, when we read the Bible, we can have quite a wrong uh, understanding of this word and of the meaning of this word. This book is a Bible. It's made up of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. This is our Bible. And this book is not a Western-minded book. This book is a Middle Eastern-minded book. It's subject to Middle Eastern understanding of who God is and what our relationship to God is. So when we look at Scripture, when we look at it in context, we, we must look at it in the context in which it was written, in the context of which it was understood. And the themes and the lessons that it, it gives us should be understood within that context. Because otherwise, we can very easily misunderstand. If we try to impose our Western way of thinking onto an understanding which isn't based on the Western um, way, then we can misunderstand. Let me, uh, let me just think about something with you. Would you agree that we have a God who never changes? We have a God who never changes. He's never changed from eternity to eternity. He will never change. We believe that, don't we? Our God does not change his mind about anything. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. Even when certain people pleaded with God, such as Moses, such as Abraham, he always had his purposes in mind. His purposes never changed. And his purposes was always to save and redeem. That's what he's always wanted to do. He's always wanted relationship. And he wanted a relationship with us, a creation. And we blew it. So he had to find a way back. And he did it. 
because he wanted to keep that, that relationship going. Now, people have got a, a strange idea sometimes that the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and judgment and you do as you're told or I'm going to zap you. And that the New Testament is a God of grace and love and warm and cuddly. What have we just said is the same. You'd be surprised how many Christians think that God is a God of wrath in the Old Testament and is a God of love in the New Testament. Where did we get that from? I'll tell you where we got it from. It's a second century heresy called Marcionism. That's what it is. And you'd be surprised how prevalent it is even in the church today. Our God has loved us from eternity to eternity. He never changes. His purpose has never changed. His desire has never changed. So you can see how easily we can put our viewpoints onto Scripture to make it think of, well, this is what we've always known. This is what we think. But is it working with the Word of God? Does it align with the Word of God? Paul said, test everything to Scripture, didn't he? So we have to be careful. It's the same God who has always loved us, his rebellious creation, and who sets in place his own rescue plan to redeem and restore us. And so it's very easy to get caught up in defining words and defining th- issues in the light of where humanity stood at any particular time in God's revelation. So we have to, what I'm trying to say, probably a long way around, is that we need to understand what the Bible says as it is in, within its context and understanding. And there's lots of things that we could talk about, but I want to talk about obedience because as we will see, the Bible's understanding of obedience is not what I've just said in that definition. It's very different. And it's actually liberating. It gives you freedom. And that's what the Word of God should do, isn't it? It should give us freedom in Christ. So let's just ask the question, what does the Bible define as obedience? Now we do have to go back to the Old Testament, okay? And we work our way through. So obedience in the Old Testament, it's centred around an adherence to God's instructions for living, okay? These were revealed to Moses and the prophets had the job of constantly bringing the people back to God's um, instructions. That was their function, reminding them, tapping them on the shoulder all the time. You're falling short again. You need to repent. You're falling short again. You need to repent. That was one of the major ministries of the prophets returning the people back to God all the time because they kept wondering. One minute they were all for God, the next minute they were worshipping idols. And they were doing that because of human nature, weren't they? Now we've talked about what the Western understanding of obedience is, but what is interesting is in, in the Hebrew script and in the Hebrew language, there isn't a word in Hebrew that defines obedience in the way that we understand it in the West. It's because the biblical understanding is very different. And the biblical understanding is to hear and to follow. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? The biblical understanding of, of obedience is to hear and to follow. Now, this is exactly what Abraham did, wasn't it? He heard God 
and he followed him. He listened to God's voice. He computed what God was saying to him and he said, okay then, I'm going to follow you. He obeyed. He heard and he followed. He went to a land he did not know. And all the way through his life, that's what he did. Hebrews 11 tells us, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. The important words, by faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise, For he, that Abraham, was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So Abraham lived this life out. He's a very good example of hearing God's voice and following. And you see this going through, through the Old Testament and we see it with the children of Israel. So when God wanted the Israelites to obey him, he told them to listen and then to act. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be frontlets on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The word, the Hebrew word for hear, most commonly used is when God wants us to hear and follow. That word is Shema. The first words of that, um, um, those verses is the affirmation of Judaism. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ahad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, he is one. And in these verses, God tells us how to respond. He told the people how to respond. In verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. First of all, God is proclaimed and he's put in the right place. Verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your might. This is our duty. Jesus said this was the greatest commandment, didn't he? What is the greatest commandment, he was asked? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. And then he took the the other verse uh, from Leviticus, I believe. You you love your neighbour as yourself. And that was putting obedience into practice. It's all right proclaiming that God is King and God is Lord. But if you don't put obedience into practice, they're just empty words. Verse 6, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. God's words should be written on our hearts. This is what Jeremiah said, wasn't it? That no longer would the covenant be written on tablets of stone, but it would be written in your heart. This is what the new covenant was all about. That he took God's instructions and made them a reality in people's hearts rather than just having to have them on a piece of stone. So God becomes something within us. And then he goes on to say, you shall teach your children. You'll talk about God at every opportunity with your family. And when you lie down, you'll 
think about God. When you get up, you'll think about God. When you walk down the road, you'll think about God. You'll bind them as a sign on your hands and they'll be before your eyes. On the forehead, you shall write them on the doorposts and on your gates. So every time you walk out of your house, you will see God's word. God will encompass everything. And this is the secret of obedience, that God encompasses everything that we are and what we do. See, these were practical expressions of obedience. And this is why we talk about the three R's. It's about relationship, not rules and regulations. God's instructions for living were never about rules and regulations. Mankind made it into rules and regulations. It was always about relationship. So when God wanted obedience, he wanted a relationship. It's about relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now I've read those verses to you and explained what they mean. And wouldn't you say that that sounds so much like a New Testament expression of relationship to God? Wouldn't you say so? Yet this is the Old Testament we're talking about. Of course it does. Because the New Covenant is built on the foundations of the Old Covenant. The two coexist. They cannot be separated from each other. So we cannot have the God of wrath and anger and the God of love and grace. God is eternal and consistent in his love for us. And God's word is eternal and consistent in instructing us and building us up in the faith and strengthening us and building relationship with God. It's all about hearing, being attentive to what God is saying and then responding. And even as modern day believers set aside what the children of Israel did or the New Testament church did, even as modern day believers, we can either respond favourably to God or we can disobey him. God gave us his commandments. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He didn't say it was optional. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will obey what I say. Because, not because I'm telling you what to do and you must do it, but because I love you and I want a relationship with you and I want you to have that relationship with me. And out of that relationship, the natural thing will be that you will walk with me and that you will talk with me and that you will want to do what is the right thing to do? And that is to follow, love, worship the living God. I once read, and this might surprise you, um, perhaps it won't, I don't know. But I once read that there are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. And that's true. There are 613 commandments in the Old Testament but there are 1,050 commandments in the New Testament. Interesting, isn't it? And why would that be? You know, oh, you're under grace, brother. You're free now, you can do what you like. Hmm, really? What about the the 1,050 commandments then? Because the commandments of Jesus bring you into freedom. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. He takes us into freedom. And that, of course, is what the world doesn't understand. That when we love the Lord and when he comes into our hearts and changes us and revolutions us and makes us into what I've just been banging about 
the last few times I've been preaching, a new creation. That still gets to me. God has made me a new creation. He's not done me up and sent me out and cleaned me up and said, off you go, son, you know, do what I want you to do. He's actually made me completely new. Isn't that fantastic? Completely new. But there is a cost. There's 1,050 commandments plus the 613. You see, Jesus raised the bar, didn't he? He got to the core. He didn't just get to the, to the symptoms. He got to the core of the problem and the problem was always sin. Remember that the Old Testament, the, the instructions that God gave and the sacrifices were just a temporary covering. But when Jesus came, he blew the lid off that because he said, You've, we've got to deal with the core of what your problems are. And the core of your problems that's going to create eternal separation from your Heavenly Father is the sin in your life. And that has to be sorted out. But he made a way for that to be sorted. Praise God. And Jesus, as I say, raised the bar when it came to obedience. He demonstrated a life of pure obedience to his Father. And he did this because he was in relationship he didn't go to God every morning in prayer and God gave him a list of do's and don'ts for the day. Or a bunch of jobs, get these jobs done and you'll be all right. No. Jesus went early in the morning and prayed and spent time with his Father so he could maintain his relationship with the Father and he could hear the Father's voice. He could think about what God had spoken to him about and then he followed him and went out and did it. He did exactly the same as Abraham. He did exactly the same as the children of Israel. Because that is how the Bible defines grace. Uh, sorry, obedience. I don't know where grace came from. Well, I do know where grace came from. <laughs> A whole different subject. Perhaps another day. But no, no, that's where it's... It came from this obedience, this relationship with his father. You see, he only ever did what the father told him and instructed him to do. In John 5, verse 19, it says, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he, he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. You see, Jesus was obedient to God in every way. He spent time with his Father. He built his relationship with his Father. He maintained the relationship that he had with his Father in heaven. Within the confines of this human human body that he was in, he still maintained his relationship with the Father. He lived the principle of obedience laid out in the Old Testament to perfection, even to the point of giving himself on the cross. Philippians 2 verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And what was the outcome of this Perfect obedience. For this reason also, God highly exalted him 
and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The consequences of Jesus' obedience was exaltation. God exalted him above every name. The other consequence, of course, was that he redeemed his creation and brought us back to the Father. He restored us back to the set. He brought us back as a prized possession. Now, when we look at the Greek, we do have a word that covers this. And it's the most common word that's used to talk about obedience. And I'm not very good at pronouncing it. Um, Hup akoe, I think, something like that. And it's a compounded word that literally means, and I think this is quite interesting, to listen under. And I can understand this because this is how Jesus taught. His disciples listened under his authority and under his rule. So to obey is to listen to God. So the New Testament actually builds upon the principles of the Old Testament. It doesn't say obey is do as you're told or you're in trouble. He actually, when Paul particularly is writing his letters and he talks about obedience, he's talking about this relationship again, relationship with God. He said, the sense of these words are that you understand and you respond. And really, obedience is an outward expression, isn't it, of what's gone on inside. It's an outward expression. It's all about attitude. And that's probably why we find it so difficult. Because we still have that old nature that's fighting away. And even when God speaks to us, we, we, we suddenly go a bit deaf. You know, we sometimes wonder what, I'm sure somebody's talking to me, but I don't quite catch what he's saying. Our old nature is constantly interrupting the flow of communication. It does it all the time. So it's really about attitude. If you want to develop obedience to God and develop relationship with God, you have to want to do it. You've got to be prepared to put in the graft. You've got to be prepared to spend the time with God. You've got to be prepared to spend um, serious time with God or else our relationship with God will never develop. And we all, I don't know about you, but I certainly do fall very, very short of what I should do. It's a struggle, isn't it? Let's be honest with ourselves. It's a struggle. Even Paul struggled, didn't he? The things I want to do, I can't do. The things I don't want to do are so easy. You know? But he understood obedience. He understood that unless he had a relationship with God, a deep relationship with God, he was never going to amount to anything. Didn't he say, look at me, I'm, you know, everybody thinks I'm Mr. Wonderful. Everybody looks at what I used to be. I was faultless, but I counted as rubbish for what I can aspire to, to have. What Paul wanted was to be close to God and to have revelation from God, to have relationship with God, to hear 
and to follow. And that's what he did. He had to give up his aspirations, didn't he? I was listening to a, a, a little podcast the other day and um, some of you may, I may have sent it to some of you. And he was talking about when God works in the mundane in our lives. And the thing that sort of struck me was that uh, Paul, had, Paul had it all sorted out, you know, in his head, what he was going to do. Um, he was going to go to Spain. He was going to end his days in Spain. The big missionary ending in Spain. He was going to uh, collect all the, the the offerings, take them to Jerusalem. He was going to do his stuff, and and then he was going to go out, and he was going to go to Spain. He was going to come into Europe that way. But God had other plans. He was arrested. He was put on trial, and he was sent to Rome, to the centre of the empire. And he writes, Philippians, I believe. And he said that I got it all sorted. And then I had to listen to God. Because God has increased the gospel because he's taken me this way. And I'm sure Paul had to learn the lesson during those days that it was important that he listened to God. God took him a completely different route. But by taking a different route, the gospel was firmly established in Rome and in the, in the, in the congregation in Rome to the point where everybody knew who he was. Everybody, all the Gentiles knew who he was in Rome. Even the imperial guard. God was doing things in the imperial guard and right in the centre of the empire, God was doing things. But Paul had to hear and to follow. And it was while he was in prison in Rome that he wrote some of the most amazing things, wasn't it? God revealed such amazing things truths to him that we still have got today and that we base a lot of our understanding of scripture and doctrine upon. Anyway, that's an aside. So in the New Testament, we have this biblical injunction to hear and to respond. It's not about rules and regulations. It's about our heart response to God. And um, I've been around church life a long time, probably like you. And uh, I think we could all say we've seen the good, the bad and the ugly. And by people have got all sorts of preconceptions in their mind and all sorts of ideas. And I think that when it comes to things like obedience, this is where we have sometimes gone wrong. Because we misunderstand and misrepresent sometimes to our peril our thinking about the nature of God. We have a God who is just and he's true. A God who cannot stand sin or rebellion in his sight because that separates us from God. He breaks his heart because it separates us from him. Not because he wants to kick us out, but because it separates us. It's the thing between us. But he has at the same time, he is a God who has made a way of escape from the eternal consequences of sin. And that is through his son, isn't it? Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. So that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So when we accept his offer of redemption, when we come to a relationship with God, this is the start of our relationship. And our relationship is built upon hearing and responding. If we live in our homes and nobody ever listens to us 
and nobody ever responds to us, it becomes a very painful existence, doesn't it? But by hearing and responding to God, he starts to lead us and build us up and minister to us. He gives us a purpose. He gives us a reason to live. And by doing that, we respond to God in a positive way. Not because we have to, but because we want to. Because we love him. And we want to develop the relationship that he's made new in our lives. So, I trust that you would agree with me that biblical obedience actually is quite different from the definition that I read out at the very beginning. It's a far cry from it if the truth is known. But it's with that understanding And I've deliberately spent this evening talking about what obedience is so that we, when we look at the life of Samuel, we'll understand why Samuel did things that he did and why he reacted to certain things the way that he did because we'll understand who he is and what motivated him and drove him forward. So we're going to look at at pictures of Samuel's obedience of the next couple of sessions. Because the reality and the truth is that he was a man who listened to God. What God told him, he thought about it. And then he responded. And the way that he responded was that everything that he did glorified God and worked out God's purposes for the nation, worked out the purposes of God for this planet, for this earth, for our humanity. So I'm quite looking forward to going over these these stories and drawing out the truth of obedience. And my prayer is at the end of it, we will have a real understanding of being obedient to God and that it will help us to come closer to Him. Because that's the whole point, isn't it, of this, that we are drawn closer to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray that you will just let it meditate and rest in our hearts now. In Jesus' name, amen.